Next, we have the Ann Arbor Public Schools Comprehensive Room Ventilation Study, Dr. Swift. Thank you, trustees. I appreciate the heavy lift. Uh, as as uh, a few of you mentioned to me today, this is uh, pretty much the heftiest report that you've received in quite a while. Um, I'm reminded, trustees, of the physical assessment of all the properties in the night. We had to roll in the reports because they were there were so many of them and they were big. Um, this one was delivered to you uh, technically, so you do have all of those uh, available to pop open. Uh, what Mr. Lauzana and his team and contractors have done is to create an overview, and that's what Mr. Lauzana will share now. And, and it does show a few examples of specific schools, uh, but then separately you have the file with every single school report. I will remind the community um, and trustees, you're very familiar. This is very similar to how we report our water quality reports that, that Mr. Rice, Mr. Latsana, Ms. Minnick and the team uh, publish is that it is a rather hefty reporting of every faucet, um, every every faucet that we drink from in every building in the district. This is a similar kind of analysis. Um, I do want to give uh, my gratitude to Mr. Lautzana. I had feared uh, that this project was um, uh, immense, um, and it is immense. I do not know of another district that's doing this in-depth of analysis in order to ensure uh, uh, quality indoor air uh, in our learning environment for teachers, for students, and for our families. So I just want to publicly uh, applaud and thank um, Mr. Lautzana, Mr. Rice, and Ms. Minnick and our partners uh, this was conducted by an outside group. I know we often receive input from the community that they're more interested in what outside folks have to say about um, our analyses. And so this one was conducted by a highly regarded outside partner, and it has been in progress for quite some time. We have been driving over recent days to get it published because we uh, were receiving more and more questions, and we realized that this would be an important component to increasing our goal, trustees, is to increase and improve the level of confidence and comfort for our students and staff in returning to the building um, through the factual analysis of the quality of our indoor air. So Mr. Lautzana, we'll hand it over to you to walk us through um, indoor air quality room by room uh, in 3.5 million square feet in the Ann Arbor Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Swift. Uh, good evening, Board of Education, Ann Arbor community. I am pleased to be here to uh, provide uh, this report on the ventilation study results for our elementary and K-8 buildings. We anticipate the report uh, for the secondary buildings and our other buildings will be completed next week and we'll certainly provide that uh, on the website and, and uh, perhaps present that here as well. Um, so uh, just to reiterate some of the, the things that Dr. Swift mentioned in her presentation, we have done a deep uh, commissioning of all of our systems. This effort started in April and was quite extensive and took many months to complete. Um, we've also uh, done the uh, study that we're here uh, today to talk about. We've retained Fishbeck, uh, formerly FTC and H, a Michigan-based uh, architecture and engineering for firm with a very deep bench of mechanical engineers that have been assigned to this project for the last uh, several months, and it has been uh, quite, the, quite the effort, and we really appreciate their partnership, especially over the last two weeks, um, uh, dedicating a lot of hours to this endeavor. Um, so I'll just jump in here. We have been taking a lot of guidance from uh, the, the Harvard School of Public Health and their uh, Healthy Buildings Institute. Um, they've been there since the beginning of this pandemic, providing guidance 
on the operations of buildings, um, how to conduct hybrid learning, and a whole lot of other things. And the, uh, the report that you're going to see is based in large part on their wonderful work and guidance, very specific guidance that they've been able to provide uh, to schools. Um, some, some guidance is a little vague out there, um, and thankfully, this guidance is, is fairly specific. Um, so, uh, again, this is from the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health, and this image is from one of their uh, reports with recommendations, and it's kind of a decision tree, and I'm going to hopefully walk through this a little bit. Um, so the first question is, does your building rely on only natural ventilation or do you have a mechanical ventilation system? Um, the, it, believe it or not, there are quite a few buildings out there that do not have uh, ventilation or duct work or the provision of fresh air. They simply have a, a heating system, if you will, uh, like a base, baseboard radiators. If you do not have a natural ventilation or a mechanical system, then the recommendation is to open windows and use fans. Uh, you don't really have a lot of other choices in that case. Um, if you do have a mechanical ventilation system, there are two primary, um, two primary uh, recommendations. Uh, the first is to exhaust airflow between zones, in particular in restrooms. And so part of our commissioning has been to ensure that all restroom exhaust fans are operational. Um, we view uh, restrooms, and a lot of people do, as places where um, aerosols are more uh, uh, abundant and more easily generated as people wash their hands, blow their nose. The aerosols can enter the air. By having those bathroom fans operational while the buildings are occupied, that creates a negative pressure so that the air in the restroom is exhausted up and out of the building and isn't allowed to flow back into the classroom or the hallway where it could potentially uh, be a risk factor. Um, and the, the other side here on the, on the left that we're gonna be talking about tonight is the supply air. So increase your outdoor air ventilation to at least ASHRAE minimum. That's that enhanced indoor air quality mode that we're putting our buildings in. Um, typically you operate buildings as kind of a balance between how much energy you wanna spend and how much fresh air you want to provide. And ASHRAE provides minimum amounts of fresh air um, that you're supposed to provide with our new enhanced indoor air quality mode in operation, we're, we're able to far exceed those ASHRAE uh, minimums uh, or code minimums. Um, in addition, disabling demand controlled ventilation, which is uh, a system that operates solely on um, occupancy and you turn that off, you're able to provide more uh, ventilation. And then can you increase your ratio of outdoor air and recirculated air? And the, our, uh, uh, in our case, yes, we're able to do that. And again, that's that uh, um, uh, commissioning and the enhanced indoor air quality mode. And so the, the kind of color chart on the bottom right here is really driving this study. Um, it's, it's saying how much air change or how many times are you able to change the air, air changes per hour in any given space. Um, and they set a threshold of four to five air changes as good five to six is excellent and above six is ideal. And we've adopted in this study that we're, we're saying, you know, we want at least five air changes per hour in all of our spaces, or we will take additional actions to provide more. And why is this important? Um, it's important because uh, air changes have been shown to reduce the risk of catching diseases in indoor environments. Um, this is from a, a, a well, a kind of known study that looked at uh, measles outbreaks in New York City public schools in the 1970s. And they, in, in retrospect, they sort of looked back in time and had rates of infection and things like that. And they determined that air changes per hour had a direct correlation to the transmission of measles. So on the left side of this chart going up and down, you'll see the probability of catching measles. And that, again, this is, this is Understand this isn't a fully occupied classroom. This is not in a hybrid model with a 50% or less occupancy. And then across the bottom are the air changes per hour. How many times are we able to flip the air in a room per hour? And you can see just getting to that first air change reduces the probability of disease transmission by 50%. Um, and as you move down the chart, 
once you get to four or five or six air changes, you've picked up most of the benefit of that risk mitigation strategy. Sure, if you can turn the air a little bit more, you get a little bit better, but really once you get to four or five or six, you've maxed out the value of that strategy as a risk mitigation strategy. So this is just an example of how you calculate the air changes per hour in a room. So um, if you have a room that is 30 feet wide and 30 feet long, kind of a typical classroom size, 30 by 30, and it has a 10 foot high ceiling, that room has 9,000 cubic feet of air inside of it. Um, if the ventilation system provides 1,000 cubic feet per minute, um, this is just how, this, how the engineers do it, CFM. So this is in minutes. So 1,000 cubic feet per minute times 60 minutes in one hour, you're able to change 60,000 cubic feet of air per hour. Uh, dividing your 60,000 cubic feet uh, per hour by your 9,000 cubic feet of uh, air in the room, uh, that would lead to a calculation or a total of 6.6 .6 air changes per hour in that given space. So more about air changes and uh, recommendations. So code minimum currently uh, is to provide, depending on space type, 2.8 to 3.5 air changes per hour. Uh, recommended rates for better air quality are above five air changes. And when operating in the enhanced indoor air quality mode, our buildings are able to generally provide between five and 11 air changes, depending on the room and or school mechanical systems. In a small number of spaces, and in our study, we're finding that is in big box spaces, primarily such as gyms and multi-purpose rooms, we have calculated the air changes to be below five. So not meeting our minimum threshold, and this is in part due to the high ceilings in many of these spaces and the large, extremely large volumes of air in those spaces. In cases where uh, the air changes were found to be less than five per hour, we are supplementing uh, with portable air cleaners, with HEPA filters. These are able to provide additional air changes. And in a few cases where uh, the number of air cleaners would become excessive, we're introducing a large fans uh, and, and open doors to the outside. So these are those devices that would help mitigate. Um, on the top is a, is a portable air cleaner uh, that's able to provide about 300, 250 to 300 CFM cubic feet per minute of uh, filtered air, depending on the model. And below is, is a, a large fan. These fans can provide anywhere from 3,000 to uh, 7,000 or even 10,000 cubic feet per minute and really move a lot of air out of the space. So all of these mitigation strategies will be implemented prior to return to hybrid in all spaces. And then all spaces will have an excellent air quality of five or above. So this is what we found at a high level. We found 96% of our elementary school square footage is able to provide five air changes and be in the excellent category. We found 2% of our spaces fall into that good category at four to five, and those will be uh, mitigated. And then 2% uh, is below the four air changes. Uh, the vast majority of the areas that need additional air changes are gyms, <clears throat> media centers, and multi-purpose rooms. Um, and all elementary school classrooms are above five air changes per hour without any corrective action. And that's often due to each classroom typically has its own ventilation unit. Um, it's not shared with other classrooms and those units are able to provide that if we put it in the, uh, the maximum mode. Uh, individual school results will be available on the website hopefully uh, tomorrow. So I just wanna preview what uh, these reports look like. We're going to start with a school that is 100% uh, green, if you will. This is um, Pittsfield Elementary School, and you'll see on the on the right is a on the left is the floor plan, and the shaded areas in green are above that threshold. And so you'll see here everything is shaded green and above uh, the 
the, the, the threshold of five air changes. And then on the, on the right, you see a breakdown of the actual spaces. So the gym has 5.5, the multi-purpose room has uh, an incredible amount of air changes potential at 12.7. And then you'll see here the classrooms are at 8.1 and 7.5. And in these reports, you won't see every single classroom listed because a lot of them repeat. They have the same footprint. They have the same mechanical system. So if we, um, you know, we're, we're doing a couple to make sure that we're, we're getting it right. And then if it's a repeated classroom layout and equipment, we're just doing it once or twice and uh, doing it in that way. And so you'll see here, Pittsfield is looking great. They're able to provide a lot of ventilation uh, with the existing equipment. So moving to Allen, um, Allen has a floor plan like this, and there's a few uh, classrooms in the lower level. That's the piece at the bottom here. And you'll see in our key that 95% of the floor area of Allen is above five air changes, and that there's 5% between the four and five. And that is the yellow shaded area on this floor plan, that's this corridor, and here the media center. And so in the uh, Excel chart on the side, you'll see the air change values here. You'll see that the corridor is at 4.5. So it's in the good category, but we want excellent. And then we have the media center at 4.2. Um, the column to the right of that shows what those air changes will be after we take corrective action. In this case, at the bottom, you'll see the corrective actions. So in corridor A, we're adding a portable air cleaner, and that brings it up to six. And in the media center, we're adding two portable air cleaners, a little bit larger units at 300 CFM, and that gets us to the five. So that's Allen Elementary. And so this is Lakewood. Um, Again, all of the classrooms in Lakewood are above the threshold, but we have some issues with the media, with the multipurpose room falling into the red category and the gym falling into the yellow category. And so you'll see in the area breakdown, 89% of Lakewood is above and in that excellent category, 3% is in the good category, and then 8%, the large multipurpose room is falling below that. You will notice, um, there are two exterior doors on the multipurpose room, and there is, I believe there are actually two exterior doors on the gym. The diagram only shows one. Um, so for the multipurpose room, you'll see the corrective actions here. It's at a 3.2. The corrective actions for the multipurpose room include adding four portable air cleaners and one 3000 CFM fan, which would go in one of those exterior doors and that gets the space up to 8.1, well and above the excellent threshold. Um, in the case of the gym, we're adding two portable air cleaners and that will get them from a 4.2 to the 5.5. Um, so again, these will be published for every single elementary and K-8 school. Um, uh, hopefully we'll get them up in uh, tomorrow. Um, and overall, 96% of our Square footage is in the excellent category. 2% of our square footage is in the yellow category or the good category, and 2% is below that. And we will be using a combination of portable air cleaners and fans uh, to uh, mitigate the issues that we're finding in some of our big box uh, spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lazzano.